This week on the Virtual Skeptics, Bob remembers why we never, why he never reads the comments. He even introduces Annie, the charitable ghost. Sharon says, someone died. Be respectful. And that's in caps. Um, and Tim is blank again. <laughs> I'm your host, Brian Gregory. Ignore the duct tape. It's a, it's a prototype. Is that even me? <laughs> <laughs> At least it made Bob laugh. It's easy to make Bob laugh. It's not hard because I have this natural giddiness that just spills out all over the place. Go ahead and spill it on the rest of us. Spill it. Sorry. Yeah. Um, ew. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, Moisture aside. <laughs> God. Uh, yes. Things are as chaotic as they normally are here on the Virtual Skeptics. This is our panel. You want to meet the panel? Here's the panel. We have Bob. There's Bob. See, there's Bob. CSI conspiracy guy, web columnist, blogger for Skeptical Manies, and Swift Block contributor. There's Eve Eastbert, editor and blogger at Skeptical Manies, and contributor to uh, Skepticality, and I'm tripping on words. Sharon, editor of Doubtful News and author of the CSI Sound Sciency web column. And Tim Farley. Hi, Tim. Uh, Jerry Fellow, founder of Skeptool, Skepticality contributor, and creator of What's the Harm? And we're live talking to ourselves for about an hour, uh, but you can ask us questions if you really, really, really want to, or just make some snarky comments, which we love. Mm -hmm. uh, post it on the YouTube channel, on the chat, on not, not the chat, the comments, or uh, tweet with hashtag virtual skeptics, and we'll try to get your questions on the show. So, let's do this, because I always try to do this first. It's this week in the robot apocalypse. And I'm going to start off with one thing that we all want, and that is giant robotic dragonflies. Ooh, I'll oh, take I thought somehow you were going to just say dragon. Yeah, that no, would have been dragons, cool. Awesome. Dragons would be it's cool, too. Best. Way to set us up and knock us down, <laughs> Ryan. Yeah. So, is this showing? This is, yeah. this is being really this slow. Very convincing oh, looking. Oh, wow. It is, it is about, let's see, this thing is huge. It's... um. 60 centimeters across and 40 centimeters long, so it's it's big. Um, it's, That's not uh, bad. Yeah. Well, there probably really were dragonflies that big in the... They are comparing it to um, a Paleozoic dra dragonfly, fly, about the same size, which is just for dramatic... Same effect, operating but, system. Yeah, same, yeah, same operating system. Mm -hmm. Windows. Um... That's what's so going to hit. Yeah, so it's it's supposed to the wings actually are are modeled after real dragonfly uh, wings. Um, in addition to having regular servos on the wings, it has a uh, ninitol nitinol muscles body to change shape so it can distribute the weight and affect the flight path. Uh, if you're not familiar with what nit uh, nitinol. Is. Yes, it's nickel titanium alloy, and it's a it's a uh, metal alloy that has shape memory. So you apply heat to it, and it changes shape based on the the heat. It's actually pretty cool science stuff. Um, Why is this, this flying around in a prison? Um, <laughs> I recognize that building. Yeah, I've seen things uh, demoed in there like before. A, yeah. Uh, this is done by a company called Festo, and it's a one of their experimental prototypes. Unfortunately, Which you can't buy it. Uh, it's a German company. Mm -hmm. um, they, uh, yeah, they showed off their Smart Bird at the 2011 TED, which is probably a video online. It, I didn't go look for it, but I want one. Unfortunately, uh, it's a expensive prototype, and I can't buy one. Uh -huh. So I'm lamenting my army of robotic dragonflies. Okay. Well, there's always Christmas. There's always Christmas. Next story. Um, December this year, they're going to ramp up the uh, competition for the DARPA Robotic Challenge. If you have or the, the DARPA Robotic Challenge, uh, this is a snap from the website. Um, these are humanoid robots that will be com competing in tasks that are uh, modeled off of doing rescue in, in hazardous environments. Um, and there's some examples on the website here of like uh, uh, oil spills, um, nuclear reactors. Contaminated environments, those kinds of things. They're all humanoid, and they're all wicked cool. The um, Boston Dynamics has something to do with this story because you know we all love Boston Dynamics. 
they um, built, we'll see, okay, when you enter this contest, you can either build your own hardware or you can build a software platform to control a standard piece of hardware. Boston Dynamics built the Atlas, which is based on their Petman, which we've seen on here, um, which is this, the generic platform that you can use to enter as only a software vendor. But there's also a number of other com competitors, uh, NASA GPL, um, is entering the Robo Simian, which is actually less than humanoid. Looks like a four. It's like a, uh, a spider, but only four legs. Um, That's a dog. No, it's not the dog. <laughs> it's it's flat like a spider, okay. and it can climb ladders. Uh, Drexel University's got their Hobo, which is uh, a Hubo. Sorry, mispronounced <laughs> it. Which it looks a lot like the robot. Yeah, it's a hobo <laughs> robot. Yes. Um, which looks a lot like the Sony um, Asmo. Is it Asmo? Yeah. Um, CMU it has the Chimp, which I, they don't actually have hardware yet, so there's no picture. Um, and there's a couple other platforms from uh, there's here. There's one from uh, Johnson Space Center, but theirs is. I see they're, they're, these guys are way behind their schedules. They need to get their act together if they're going to compete this year. Uh, but the idea is for, for these things to compete for a... Um, You're a robot snob. Yes, I am a robot snob. Uh, Two million dollar prize. Um, and it'll be awarded in December of 2014. So keep your eye up. Uh, the uh, virtual, there's a virtual um, competition that starts in June. And then the uh, the hardware and real tri trial start in December, so all that stuff is going to be on online. You just watch for it. It's really, really cool. It just occurred to me. Do you remember a couple years ago there was a, a new material that uh, you could put on your hands and it was sticky? Um, it was lots and lots new? of little, little what? tiny fibers. Lots of little fibers that were sticking out. It increased the surface area uh, on your uh, hand. So it was, it was a like fly paper kind of I effect. Do you don't remember? Do you remember that? No. Oh, I, I just think, remember that. I think that we could like take Osimo and like turn him into a robotic Spider Man. Tell me that wouldn't be freaking awesome. It would be I think awesome. we just won a DARPA award right there. Just for that idea. Yes. Yeah. You're welcome. It's free. It, Go okay. for it. I think you actually awesome. have to build something, Bob. No, the, yeah, no, this is like a this yeah. is like one of those TED talks where you just have a great idea yeah. and just like go so, do it. We're a think tank. That's right. We're not so, a do tank. So, so, so moving on, and you guys know how much I love Kickstarter programs. There's another one I found. Um, it's been in the news lately because they're running out of time. They got 40 days to get their funding. They're um, so close. Yeah, they're they're not very close. But it's a really cool project. It's um, let's see here. It's uh, oh crap. It's in a uh, UK university called the Harriet Watt University, um, and they have an idea of making coral repairing robots. So they use submersibles with arms, and they're going to be autonomous. They have a um, standard method of that's already used by humans to take broken coral and rebuild it with these frameworks. Um, and it takes months to years to, to do these kind of repair work. They, they say that they can get down to weeks with some automated robots. They have a plan to do it. The uh, Kickstarter is only enough funding for them to, uh, to build two prototype robots and do a demonstration at an uh, aquarium. So this is a very expensive project. Not a lot of interest, but I think it's really cool. I wanted to see this happen. So, hey, go out there and give some money. You can get your name on the robots themselves if, if that's something that you find sexy uh, or something mm -hmm. like that. So cool. there you go. We've got uh, an army of robotic dragonflies. We've got an army of rescue robots that will turn on us eventually. And then we have the We ocean. have to kickstart the robot apocalypse. Yeah. Really, that <laughs> seems totally unfair. They should have used that in their, you know, to attract people. Yeah, people <laughs> too can fund the robot apocalypse. Oh, yeah, they'll fund well, a Death Star. Right, yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> <laughs> there. But I was just saying, wow. this, you're going to have running ro robots on land, we're going to have dragonflies <laughs> in the air, we're going to have killer robots with Warming. coral in the ocean, so there you go, there's nowhere to hide. You know what you need? In for my this, basement. For at times like these, Brian, what you need in this segment is you need one of those clocks that's perennially, perennially showing <laughs> oh, five minutes free. to midnight. <laughs> yeah, and when, like when you show us something closer. <laughs> show us how close to the robot apocalypse robot you are. Robot apocalypse yes. ready. Right. Yeah. <laughs> We're now at DEFCON 6. <laughs> or or give us a color code or something. We've got... Yeah, Definitely. Yeah. And you can move it back if someone invents an Asimov's three laws on a chip. All right. You move the, you move the power back, right? <laughs> yeah. That would be great. Oh, cool. Where the heck are my notes? So, um, Bob, what's your story? Because I uh, just put my notes away for some strange reason. Okay, yeah. Um, as you might have heard, uh, Brian. Explain yourself, Bob. There was a bombing in Boston. What? Yeah, I know. Oh there was a bombing God. in Boston. Um, and the, the police terrible. have been keeping many details uh, confidential um, as the investigation proceeds. Um, I think three people were killed and dozens and scores were injured. Um, and it sounds like there was there were uh, bombs built into pressure cookers uh, that were filled with BBs and shrapnel. Um, so anyway, the the uh, the news has has suggested the the investigation is trending towards domestic terrorism at this point. Um, and I, I'm curious to see if that line of evidence uh, holds up. But in the meantime, um, there's a lot of room to speculate about what's going on. And people who have nothing better to do have been doing, like, you know, cable news commentators, have been doing exactly that, um, filling it with um, uh, questionable information and speculation. Um, and because there's so little information um, – Every little tiny detail will come under the most intense scrutiny and be tortured to the point of uselessness. Um, I see an opportunity here because lately in the States, we've been getting very weary of mass killing. Um, it's actually becoming dispiriting. You know, um, it's, it's always bad, but we just – I think the Onion had a little thing of a flag in front of the post office doesn't remember the last time as it was at full mast, mm. right? I mean, it's that type of like, wow, how, how often does this have to happen? Um, and, and with that aggravation that we're feeling, we're, we're, being imp we're becoming impatient with crummy news, bogus analysis, and speculation. In the Senate. And then there's also our elected leaders. <laughs> um, and the one thing that, that, that gets me, I, I find the false sense of confidence that so many people have really irksome. Uh, the, when they don't have information, and one group is is finding itself increasingly despised, and that is, if you could show the first one, first slide, uh, it would be conspiracy theorists. And what we have here is a screen capture of my um, uh, tweet deck feed of a whole bunch of people who are just saying, like, I'm sick of all this conspiracy theory stuff. This is horrible. This is awful. I haven't quite seen anything like this before. I, maybe the Sandy Hook, yes, yeah, some. But I haven't seen people just this pissed off about it before. And, um, yeah, so after Aurora and Sandy Hook. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Go. You just said. You said dude. I was reading. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, no problem. So, yeah, um, this is the, the harbinger of the next, of the, uh, okay, the first. Words are hard. <laughs> I'm off script. I'm going to hide. Okay, so. I see an opera. Uh, uh, people, everyone will just li still listen. Okay, yeah, all right. So after Aurora and Sandy Hook, <laughs> many of us were plunged into a parallel Twitterverse of conspiracy and paranoia, um, and this is getting old. My first thought was actually, how are they going to spin this as a gun control-related false flag? Well, false flag narratives seem to arrive almost immediately, but Alex Jones and his co cohort of sycophants and imbeciles spun it in a surprising way. Um, as a way of expanding the authority of the TSA into the streets. Now, this is very odd. If you take the, go to the TSA website, there, the Transportation Security Administration, and you see what their mandate is. It's to protect the nation's transportation systems to ensure freedom of movement, movement for people and commerce. This means airport screening, 
baggage checking, bomb sniffing dogs, and that sort of thing. They're not trained to execute martial law or patrol the streets. You asshat, Alex. That's what they want you to think, Bob. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so the idea is... <laughs> it's their it, false mission. Exactly. So what they're really up to. And, and the idea is an absurd... It's as absurd as Alex Jones is loud and absurd. Um, so the first seed of this conspiracy theory came very, very shortly. Uh, or the first seed of a conspiracy theory came very, very shortly after the bomb uh, went off just before 3 p.m. Within an hour and a half. I don't quite remember what the time zone I saw mobile the conspiracy is. within a half an hour. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it could have been – I said within an hour and a half because it could have been a half an hour. Um, a news out, anyway. Yeah. A news outlet – in Mobile, um, mentioned that a college cross-country coach, Ally Stevenson, if you could show the next one, was participating in the marathon and commented that there were bomb-sniffing dogs on site before the explosion. And this, this is a quote. They kept making announcements to the participants, do not worry, it's just a training exercise, which I imagine it would be if nothing happened. It would just be a day out with the dogs training them. But um, so Stevenson, he saw law enforcement spotters on the roofs at the start of the race. Um, he's been in plenty of marathons in Chicago, D.C. and other metropolitan areas, but has never seen that level of security before. Quote, evidently, I don't believe they were having a training exercise. I think they must have had some sort of threat or suspicion called in. CNN reports that a, a state government official said there, was, there were no credible threats before the race. Okay, So a major problem with this testimony is that he has never before been in a race that exploded. Um, it seems natural that the salient measures of security um, are now receiving his attention after the Boston Marathon um, when they haven't received his attention before. Um, they now suddenly become really important. Um, we live in a post-9-11 world. Their security are all major events. Um, the presence of bomb dogs is not surprising. The, the other thing that gets me about this one is... Uh, the police spotters who are on the roofs. Um, how does he know that they were police spotters? Um, a, a, one person was walking on a roof near the explosion and actually received a lot of attention on the internet. And here's a picture of him. Any, any, yeah. All right, so there, there he is. What, what, you don't see him? What, but, okay. Here, here's a close-up of this sinister character. <gasps> I know. Dum, dum, dum. <gasps> it's undeniably it's a person. It's, it's, it's undeniably a, a person. A Bas Bigfoot. How dare he walk on a roof with a railing nearby? <laughs> I know. Treacherous bastard. So, as I understand. And a halo. Yeah. <laughs> and a halo <laughs> Apparently, yeah. yeah. That's the, the dead of, giveaway when there's yeah. a halo around the guy. Um, so, if, uh, I understand that as, uh, much of the crimes he needs to be documented and but that this guy was being circulated on Twitter is some, kind of befuddles me. There's nothing peculiar about someone being on the roofs along the Boston Marathon route. Um, in fact, at the finish line, it's common, and the police have been enforcing a ban on on uh, people being up on their roofs uh, because a couple of years ago someone fell through a skylight. Um, yep. So I saw that but, commercial. Yeah. <laughs> Nonetheless, the police are investigating and looking for a person of interest. Please call the FBI if you see this man. <sighs> uh, so only one job. leg <laughs> again with the Bigfoot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's actually if you go back and forth, it actually works surprisingly anyway. well. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that yeah. except Bigfoot is is a female. I know that Eve. Um, All right, just checking. That could be a female. Mm -hmm. No, no, the intercept net clearly says man on roof. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, – and actually, uh, Tim gave us a little bit of an update that someone – it was – where was it, Tim? It was Smoking about, Gun. They went smoke. and looked up what building that is. And what's on top of the building? It is a condo building, and there's a shared uh, patio on the roof with uh, patio with plants patty. and patio furniture and a railing. And it would be not unusual at all for the owners of those condos to be on that patio watching the race from up there. It's 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 beautiful how easy that is to check ultimately. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so okay. When one of uh, Alex Jones's defective correspondents, uh, Dan Bedondi, uh, managed to be at a couple of press briefings while other people, you know, were actually trying to learn things. 
first he asked, um, I think it was a, a, a police representative, um, what would have been a reasonable question had a threat been called in? I think referring to the Stevenson narrative of dogs and drills. And the answer was no, security had been upped as a matter of course. At a later conference, um, the same guy, who I believe he's a minor wrestler, um, pro wrestler. They make good uh, journalists. Good they, they actually do. He has the, and he, he does, definitely has the skill set of a, a seasoned pro wrestler um, <coughs> uh, who's been maybe mm -hmm. slammed on his head a few many times. Macho but, Man back from the dead? Not. Mm, oh, it's too soon, man. Too yeah. soon for Macho Man. Okay, so anyway, um, <laughs> Roddy uh, at the at the the same guy asked the governor a question: um, if it was a false flag operation to take away our civil liberties and let the TSA slip their hands down our pants, and the, and the gov governor said, "Yeah, oh no, no, damn," yes. said, "No next question, Eve." Um, basically, slam dunking the idiot back into irrelevancy. It, but to be fair, a lot of the questions that the reporters were asking were pretty stupid. We can't talk about operational details at this time. Could you please tell us something about the operational details? No, we can't tell you anything about the operational details. Please? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, okay. Now, there are a couple of trends that are being rehashed from Sandy Hook conspiracy theories. Um, the idea of crisis actors, which kind of became prominent in the last one, which are, are who are supposed to be actors paid to act out drama. So in this case, um, uh, this is a disturbing image coming up. Um, so go ahead. Um, yep, it's there. Yeah, uh, which comes from uh, uh, Peter Tierney's collection of Facebook shots. Um, crisis actors um, are they're, they're a, a new facet of something that's very familiar in the conspiracy world, what Michael Barkun calls fact fiction reversals. Conspiracy theorists see fiction as more real than reality and in a way that allows them to take things like the April Fool's documentary um, about – the elite secretly absconding to Mars, Alternative 3, um, as factual or to think that aliens are putting storylines into the head of Star Trek writers to prepare us for the coming robot invasion or ro robot alien, whatever. Alien robot invasion, I'm sure. That would happen too. Ooh. But, at, but at the same time, they think that the news is being acted out. And that's a really weird you know, world that they live weird. in. Because I don't, I don't remember that being part of the 9-11 um, Stuff. I don't remember anybody ever accusing anybody in 9/11 footage of being active. Well, they said that there were plants. Yeah, some of the well, plants is one thing. Those could yeah, be government yeah. agents, but specifically saying these are actors. Well, like the, yeah, the people jumping out of the building. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, they method. Yeah, but they did have, like people what was who the were connection? interviewed right after 9/11. If, if they said it sounded like an explosion, they were real. If it, the person said, "Yeah, well, planes flew into the building, and then I think it, there was fire, and it got really hot, and it collapsed. They were paid, Plants. yeah, actors. paid people, yeah. Okay. So, um, can, uh, one last thing before we we go, there there been uh, one conspiracy theory um, th that comes out. This was one we saw in Aurora. Batman had been." Uh, uh, in the Batman movie, um, someone I think like Newtown or something was mentioned, um, and so people were retrofitting the Aurora shooting and Batman movie to oh, the Sandy Hook, and so you see something like that going on here. But this time it's just a totally cynical recut of a Family Guy episode mm. that suggests Be uh, Peter is detonating a bomb at the J Boston Marathon. It's pretty horrible, and uh, Seth MacFarlane slammed it, saying it was abhorrent. Um, actually, I'm, I'm kind of hopeful that, hopeful that people are starting to pay attention to the horridness that is the conspiratorial mindset. One clever, civically-minded netizen grabbed up a number of likely conspiracy theory website names with the purpose of, quote, keeping some conspiracy kook from owning it. And um, I think I had an image yeah. of that. But, I, yeah. I, was, I don't see it in the slides, but that was cool. Yeah, so um, but that's exactly what it said, and that, that makes me happy. I'm glad for that. Yeah. So. Yeah, that was a clever idea. The problem with grabbing up 
domain names is there's always another one. If they can't get yeah. .com, they'll get .biz or .fm or .org. .org was available and the .org. slash marks were available because I went and looked to see if his yeah, name was or, up there and there wasn't get, a name. Get it with dashes in it or get yeah. it get a slightly mm -hmm. misspelled version or whatever. So but, it's a nice uh, gesture. What was yeah. nice, Bob, is is um, just one quick comment on this was I had put up my post before uh, I had read yours, and I noticed that people were suddenly extremely disgusted with conspiracy theories. So yeah. I'm hoping we've hit the peak. So after I read yours, I'm like, hey, I wasn't the only one to to think this. Yeah. I think yeah. people are really getting tired of this. So they're yeah. they're 15 minutes maybe over. I ran. I usually don't run into a ton of this, but I ran into one post somewhere on Twitter where people were accusing, and it was clearly. Uh, I didn't run down the original sources, but it was pretty obvious that it was just doctored photos. And, and they were claiming the same actress, it's the same actress who was supposedly playing the principal I, who died in the that. Newtown thing. Mm -hmm. It's the exact, there's the, if you followed the Newtown thing, whenever they talk about the principal and what she did to try to save the kids, it's always the same photo of her sitting on her couch in front of a picture frame. And someone had obviously taken that photo, wiped the picture frame out of one copy of it, put it under uh, above a, a, a Newtown crawl, and then took the stock photo and put it above a uh, Boston mass, you know, Boston, uh, Boston, the uh, marathon crawl and yeah. uh, and said yeah. here's the same actress playing two different characters and it's like that is so so cynical yeah, yeah. That, that somebody actually sat down in photoshop and did that yeah. i find that aggravating <clears throat> well uh yeah. So mm -hmm. everyone depressed? Good, my job yeah. here is done. See you later, Yay. guys. So <laughs> now we get... Is there some sort of weird logic to the connection with gold? What what is that connection? Okay, the gold thing has been um, the, the the gold price dropped over the last couple of days. Precious right. metals. Th those those are supposed to be invulnerable to inflation or something in the mythology of 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 patriot. Movements right. and, and that sort of thing. These yeah. are the same guys who want to end the Fed and exactly go, to the gold go to a gold standard. So anything bad happening to gold is something the government. Yeah, they're like, look, up. this happened the same. And gold is really inflated because a lot of people have been buying gold and silver, um, and so least, the yeah. bubble is eventually going to burst. You right. know, mm -hmm. uh, so like tulips know. and Bitcoin. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Hi the, Ben. <laughs> was it flus? Was it flus? Flues. Oh, I hadn't thought about flues in a while. Yeah, Whoopi Goldberg. Uh, so, uh, moving on Sorry. to do something a little more uplifting. Apparently, they're charitable ghosts. Dead people, more uplifting. Dead people. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, can something good people. come out of superstition, pseudoscience, and pseudo history? Pseudo, maybe. <laughs> what if a ghost gives large amounts of money to worthy charities? Even if there's no such thing as ghosts. Even if the person on whom the, go whom the ghost is based never existed. Well, the old town of Edinburgh, Scotland, originally consisted of the Royal Mile and a series of alleyways or closes. As the city expanded, these closes got overshadowed, and eventually they were built over. They had an unsavory reputation, and, as I said, were eventually closed. For a while, uh, access to them was limited. In the 1990s, however, uh, some of the closes were reopened to tours. And in 2003, the real Mary King's Close, of which there is a slide, um, opened as a tourist attraction. According to an article on the Scotsman from 2003, when the Continuum Group opened the close for tours, their mission was to set the record straight and separate fact from fiction. For the first time, visitors will learn the real, learn of the real people who lived in the close, their living conditions and trades. Sounds good. Dr. Lorna Ewan explained that they wanted to correct certain legends that surrounded the close. According to one legend, Plague victims were walled up in the close and left to die. This isn't actually true at all. Instead, the area was quarantined, and the council handed out, according to Dr. Ewan, 
handed out rations of food to people, and uh, two plague doctors were appointed. People were supplied with bread and nail. Um, if a plague death occurred, the body was removed for burial, and the family was quarantined in another area. Now, these good intentions on behalf of the tour company uh, eroded somewhat. Ghosts, unfortunately, sell better than, you know, history. In 2007, uh, in a 2007 conference paper, Carrie Clanton describes the tours of Mary King's clothes. Quote, the guide dramatically relates how in 1645, a year when nearly a third of Edinburgh's population died of the plague, the city government quarantined all the city's plague victims into the close, where they were locked in, left to rot and die, their screams echoing through the city. According to the guide on my August uh, of 2003 tour, as the corpses of plague vic victims began to rot, the smell of decay filled the streets of Edinburgh, and according to my guide's account, two butchers were sent in to clean up the mess, unquote. Now, oh, it's uplifting. Yeah. Keep in mind, this story is not true. Also keep in mind that in February of 2003, a representative of the tour company was saying they wanted to dispel this very myth. And then in August of the same year, there it was. Worse... Quote, toward the end of the tour, a man dressed as a grim reaper and representing the ghost of a butcher emerges into the room, eliciting squeals of fear from the audience, unquote. Clanton says that of all the heritage attractions I have visited in the UK is, one, is the one that most exploited its tragic past. At one point, visitors were taken into a nursery room where the deaths of a baby and her parents from the plague are described in harrowing detail. Unquote. One ghost in particular has adhered to Mary King's clothes. In the 1990s, a Japanese psychic named Eiko Gibo visited the house or visited the clothes. There was one room that at first she said she would not go into because it was filled with sadness and very sick people. Eventually, she did agree to enter because a little girl ghost named Annie was tugging at her and asked her to come in. Annie, according to her, was about eight, dirty, ragged, and crying. Annie said she had the sickness, meaning the plague, and was taken away from her family. I didn't even have time to bring a doll with me said Annie. The psychic, yeah. The psychic had her cameraman acquire a doll. She said that the doll would give the little girl rest and she would never be seen again. Well, of course, she was seen again. Also, it appears that the story of a little girl who was walled up during the plague goes back before Gibo's visit. However, it really got legs uh, after her appearance. Since the close was more generally open to the public in the early 2000s, it has received visits from Ghost Hunters International and Most Haunted. Although Annie apparently got a little bit confused uh, when communicating with Derek Cora and identified herself as Mary. But you know Whoops. what the afterlife can do to you, you just forget your name and shit. Um, <laughs> that couldn't possibly be Derek's fault. No. no. Yeah. no. He's no, just he, too good at what he does. He could have confused Annie with Mary King of the real Mary King's clothes. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. A little girl ghost who was confused. Uh, the room where the non-existed non Annie wasn't walled up <laughs> has become a sort of a creepy shrine. Gibo's gift of a doll was the first of many people. And uh, there's a picture of uh, the offerings. So there, people bring Ooh, dolls. Uh, people also leave CDs of boy bands. Uh, Justin Bieber really should visit because I'm sure if Annie were alive today and like if she'd ever been alive at all, I'm sure she'd <laughs> totally be a believer. It's in the box in the front. Oh, she'd be, she'd be yet another historical personage named Anne Annie who would yeah. be a believer. But in this case, not historical. <laughs> <laughs> but visitors don't just leave creepy gifts. 
They also leave donations to the Sick Kids Hospital, or more formally, the Royal Hospital for Sick Children. Lots of donations. The Real Mary King's Close has raised 40,000 pounds since it opened in 2003. Indeed, it has recently been nominated for the Sick Kids Heroes Award, which recognizes exceptional contributions made by staff and supporters in the courage of patients. So, how do we view this? Is it harmless good fun? Uh, and hey, money for sick kids? Uh, the BS historian asked the question this way, which I, I sort of like. But do these ends justify the means? Does misrepresenting facts of history and of science justify the money it brings in? Are we content to prostitute unique pieces of built and cultural heritage in order to keep them going? I suspect the answer is yes, but we don't all have to like it, and we should try for better. Hmm. Fair enough. Yeah, no right answer yeah. to that one, maybe. Yeah. yeah. So, um, hmm. Do you have to wear a, a pilgrim's hat or whatever she's wearing? Are, the guides apparently dress as a historical personage from, or at least theoretically historical personage from a particular time period. I think different guides dress up from different time periods. Uh, mm, okay. Does anybody got the... Uh, my uh, comment feed seems to not be updating. Here, is anybody else looking at that? I think we just lost everyone. Uh, oh, no, <laughs> no I've, I've, I've got the comments. Are there any questions? I don't see any questions about the ghost story. Well, um... We can move on to other death-related stories. <laughs> yeah, this, these aren't so going to be uplifting. any better. Yeah. <laughs> this weekend. <sighs> death and destruction. And robots. Yeah. <laughs> it's a comedy. Yeah. So I, I found a story in a UK paper. We're back to the UK. It really bothered me. This mother was, quote, begging paranormal investigators to stop speculating about whether spontaneous human combustion was to blame for the death of her daughter back in 1985. A recent book called Paranormal Merseyside was one of a string of publications and articles that offered up the idea that the girl died from spontaneous combustion. And But she was at a college cooking facility at the time and the meteor's portrayal of this event as some mystery has been clearly disturbing to the family. There was never any suggestion that her death was mixed, there was anything more than an accident that she accidentally caught on fire. But as with other cases of uh, SHC, the idea of mystery is enticing and it makes the story more dramatic and interesting. So it was also incorrect and inconsistent with the evidence, but that didn't matter. So they ended up putting it in books and, and publications and stuff like that. So you can imagine how, how awful that must be for the mother to see these reenactments and accurately depicting her daughter's tragic death. It's just, it's a horrible thing. And, Why do you uh, want to stifle free expression? Oh, shit? there you go again, Bob. Mm. Always giving me shit. Sorry. <laughs> so, but it, that's these, the people go around telling these paranormal stories. They write them in their books, they sell their books, they sell their copy, whatever. But real people died in these events, and it seems really callous to exploit them like that. But it, it happens a lot in these paranormal cases, especially like for paranormal tourism cases where a location is supposedly haunted and is connected to a, a family or an employee or someone connected to the place who actually existed. So now there's a story being told about them in which there's rarely any supporting evidence. Uh, they can't defend themselves. And they can't say it's not my spirit doing it. And the family that remains may not appreciate the mention. And so I recalled some other cases that I covered on Doubtful News that, was, that were similar to this. And I linked them in the, in the show notes, but I'll just go through a couple of them quick. In September, the brother of a murder victim was, quote, offended and angered by claims that a group of paranormal investigators used a ghost box to search for the victim's missing remains. They claim they found an implement, a spade handle, that belonged to the killer. The police said spades are found everywhere around the moor. The, this is of no value to us. 
but they made the paranormal investigators had made the claim that it was connected to the case and this showed up in a local newspaper and the brother of the murdered man made a statement in response to it how appalled he was last summer a paranormal group was featured as part of a local news story in a similar case where they invent, investigated a restaurant and declared there was paranormal activity connected to a real person who was associated with the place and the great-grandson of that man who had died in the 1960s wrote to the paper disputing that there was nothing paranormal about the death or anything afterwards and he did not appreciate the degradation of the family name and there was a cemetery in Colorado that was allowed to give ghost tours at night among the graves even after they were exposed as allowing tour guests to urinate on the premises and other rather rude behavior I don't know why a cemetery would allow tours like this anyway that's disrespectful to all the families of the loved ones there even though after they were exposed they were allowed to go back and start start charging for these ghost tours probably possibly to keep the cemetery solvent you know and finally good old Zach Baggins of Ghost Adventures TV who was happy to publicize the story that he captured EVPs from a hotel room where an actor had committed suicide Let's try it. He attempted communication with the spirits that he was interacting with that particular person, and the subsequent recordings were slated for inclusion on his music album. I don't think he asked the permission of the family for that either, and I don't know that they would appreciate that. Yeah. So in any of the cases, there was, uh, there was no indication that the family was ever consulted before they were exploit their deceased relatives were exploited. I. I kind of wonder what the what the background loop would sound like if if a ghost was interacting with Zach Bagans. It just said like hi, ba hi Zach. Zach. Hi Zach. Zach, you douche. You hmm. smell like I, a body spray. Um, <laughs> I think the most frightening aspect of this is Zach Bagans is doing a musical. Yeah, that's, <laughs> it. that's his thing. I forget oh, what it was no. called. It had a really stupid name, but. And I don't think anybody had bought it, but except he has fans. You know. He does. He has a mom. So I, I would put, I would say this isn't the same as exploiting the memories of like famous celebrities because they were famous in their time. But I think the paranormals are kind of crossing the line here. Somebody's kid died, their brother died, yeah. their mother's dead, and and this this type of clear fiction about mm -hmm. them because there's no evidence. This can't be proven it's paranormal, even connected to right. the person at all. Is is always, I think, unwanted attention, and it's pretty hurtful for the family. I don't think that's the way they want their loved ones to be remembered. And I think this is one of the unnoticed or un not not it's not brought up in attention very often that uh, it's a real effect of this paranormal stuff going on that these people are be are identifying these spirits as, as you know. It's it's extremely disrespectful. Well, there was a case a couple of years ago where the ghost hunters went into a house. And this was the first time that I'd seen them like looking for someone that the people actually knew who had died, and uh, the 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 owners knew had died. A, a fourteen year old girl, right? Yeah, uh, or something. And and I think so. And they they said they caught of her image on film, and it was a statue, a statue on their coffee table, mm -hmm. and it was it was just so atrocious what they were doing to this woman, mm -hmm. um, completely without thinking about it um it, so casually it was awful it's not as bad as psychics but it's i was gonna say it draws it reminds me of all the so many psychic cases where people with missing children or kidnapped children or uh, there were some famous cases in australia where there have been uh you know part of a mass murder and the bodies have never been found for f several of the victims and psychics are constantly coming forward with leads and the families are like please stop yeah please we, you we know have to move on we have to move on we have we've grieved for our daughter we know she's dead we don't need you calling our house and telling us these useless leads and and torturing us with this bad information Mm -hmm. they, they apparently come out of the woodwork anytime there's a, like a, a publicized missing persons case or um, murder. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure some of them honestly think they're helping. Oh, like they that. do. They don't yeah. think through the consequences of mm -hmm. what they're and they don't analyze their own work. Like you know, how successful have you actually been, and what's the chances that you're going to damage someone or hurt someone more than you're actually going to help them. Yeah. 
Well, this is very sad. Yes, this, this is, is going to be one of our show. saddest episodes <laughs> At least ever. Annie A died in the 17th century. B n- never existed. <laughs> now I'm oh, even well. more depressed. Yeah. <sighs> Tell us some good news, Tim. Yeah, freaking hurry up, dude. <laughs> good yeah, news. Yeah, you can still pull this off. <laughs> um, well, <laughs> the 2013 Pulitzers were awarded. Yeah, oh, I, I, have, I don't have a unifying topic, which is probably good because we're running short on time. I just yep. have a few kind of news items. Uh, and an uh, item that we posted on the Randy blog this morning, and Sharon had it on Doubtful News yesterday, is one of the 2013 Pulitzers, the one for editorial uh, writing, was for a campaign that went on in the Tampa Bay Times regarding Pinellas County, Florida, taking the um, – uh, uh, fluorination out of their water because a bunch of conspiracy theorists and tea partiers uh, got a few yeah. candidates on the city council or the county commission and they voted to remove it based on bogus non-existent evidence that it's dangerous or whatever. I saw and, it in a documentary. Oh no, wait, that was Dr. Strangelove. <laughs> and they um, uh, for a year there was no fluoridation in uh, Pinellas County and the Tampa Bay Times went on, they admitted, we went on to a campaign uh, and they wrote editorials and they wrote articles and they talked to the CDC and they examined the evidence and they confronted the people who were giving evidence and they showed that it was entirely nonsense and they showed the real effect of it because uh, poor get uh, uh, poor people can't get uh, fluoride from their dentist and stuff to replace the fluoride that's in the water. We're being affected, unfairly affected by this. Disproportionately, yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, a good example of social good that's done by skepticism on a topic that maybe some people might find uh, old hat anti-fluoridation. But anyway, they their campaign was successful. In the 2012 November election, two of those commissioners were defeated and replaced with pro-fluoridation commissioners, and within a couple of weeks, they voted to reverse the decision. And as of March this year, it takes some time to put these things in effect, uh, fluoridation is back in Pinellas County, Florida, and now the newspaper has a Pulitzer to show for it. Good job. So it was yeah, a classic yeah. skeptic campaign being done by the news media, and uh, and we pointed out that the other thing I like about it is this is the same paper that historically has won Pulitzers before for investigating uh, Scientology, and mm-hmm. also is the paper that came up with PolitiFact.com, and if you follow politicians saying goofy crap in the U.S., uh, PolitiFact is a great resource because they'll tell you uh, w- which things are true and which things aren't, and they have this hilarious little gauge that includes the far off the setting, which is called Pants on Fire. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> if uh, someone is just totally off the ranch, uh, they will actually give them a Pants on Fire with the gauges on fire and the needles buried in the yeah. thing. So this is mainstream media. Pay attention. There are Pulitzers in skepticism. <laughs> yep. And uh, oh, I was trying to think. Oh, last week we had our podcast challenge. Uh, oh yeah. Of which podcast? The week before. Now two weeks ago, there was a podcast that did an entire episode that was made up of fake news stories. Did anybody? Well, I know our panelists know. I'm looking to see if any of our commenters. Someone did uh, get it last Actually, week. figured it out. Yeah, yes. a couple did. Somebody somebody commented that they had just listened to it, and uh, Sharon, I think you had just listened to it. Yeah. Um, uh, I guess I you know can't drag this on any further, and actually the the reveal episode of their own will post tomorrow morning because they post their episodes on Thursday, and if you know your podcasts really well, and you know that uh, a biweekly podcast that posts on Thursday uh, <laughs> would tell you that it's skeptics with a K. Yep. So listen to the Skeptics with a K episode tomorrow, and I have been promised that they will reveal every single lie that they told <laughs> in the awesome. previous episode. And uh, I don't know if they're going to also reveal who called them on it or anything like that. I think both episodes were pre-recorded because they were so busy with 
QED. Uh, one came right before QED, and this one's after QED. So, um, and that's uh, about it that I've got time for talking. Oh, uh, just kind of a warning. I tweeted about this on Saturday, but it seems to have been affecting people because I know. Uh oh. Uh, and Derek. Derek is having trouble with his blog. If you run a WordPress blog, oh, yeah. yeah, we had trouble too. Be very careful with your admin passwords. Either you can actually, if you Google it, there's a way to disable the admin account if you don't need it. Uh, but also make sure you have a strong password on the admin account because there is a widespread thing going on right now where hackers are basically trying to break into every WordPress blog and so if you've got a, a bad password on your admin account like password one or one two one two one two or something like that they will get in and they will take over your blog and uh, make your life miserable for the next few days it's the same password on my luggage <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. That that one and my Google are like the strongest passwords I have. They're even yeah. stronger than my bank passwords. Well, I use a password manager, so I couldn't even tell you what my password is, <laughs> and it's like this long, and all I ever do is cut and paste it from the password manager to the prompt. Wow. So yeah. if you held a gun to my head, I couldn't tell you what my my Skeptool's password is. A likely story. <laughs> is it safe? Uh, okay, so um, we're running low on time, so I'm just going to jump into the announcements while everybody gets their books. A good books. idea. Okay. Uh, see, Bob was quoted in a CNN article about the Boston Marathon bombing. Yay, Bob. The link is going to be in the show notes. It was an old interview, yeah. but still, Arif. cool. Yeah. yeah, it was pretty neat. It was me just a, above uh, uh, the president, so, you know, whatever. No <laughs> big. Above the president. Yeah. Right. Okay, uh, JRF fellow Leo Ingwe, did I say Ingwe. right? Ingwe. 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 Yeah. Is trying to fund a study of witchcraft accusations in Guyana. You can donate okay. through the Foundation Beyond Belief, which link will be in the show notes. Uh, Tim has posted the slides and links alongside the video of his Skeptech presentation, which is also yep. going to be in the show notes. Also, congratulations to all the winners of Occam Awards last week at QED in Manchester, including Kylie Sturgis. The Pod Delusion, Andy Lewis for Quack Meter Blog, and Edinburgh Skeptics for Skeptics on the Fringe. Yes. Hooray. Yay. We lost Sharon. I know, but I did <laughs> I did hear that there was much wooing and foot stamping when I when Doubtful News was announced as one of the uh, contenders. Oh, okay. So, nice. Yeah, lots of UK fans. Yay. So um, on, on that note, why don't you go first, Sharon? Okay. I willingly confess to hero worship for the raw intellectual breadth and power of three great men. Darwin, who constructed my world, world. Lavoisier, because the clarity of his mind leaves me awestruck every time I read his work. And Carl Ernst von Baer, who lived too long and became too isolated to win the plopper, proper plaudits of posterity. <laughs> Whoa. But T.H. Tuxley, who ranks fourth on my personal list, regarded Von Baer as the greatest pre-Darwinist naturalist of Europe, and I doubt that any expert with the detailed knowledge to render judgment about general brilliance and specific accomplishments would disagree. You might be able to get it by proper plaudits of posterity, because nobody writes like that. <laughs> and I'm going to skip um, around. I'm going to let you go next. <sighs> okay. I was going to say a whole bunch of uh, medieval poets, too, but... Ooh, burn, I Sharon. It, I think it's William Langland, but... <laughs> the monstrous races provided challenging problems for Christian thinkers. Did they really exist? Were they humans? And if so, did they have souls? St. Augustine of Hippo, it's a great name for uh, monsters, yes. writing in the 4th century, expressed measured caution about the monstrous ra races, writing, It is not, of course, necessary to believe in all kinds of men which are said to exist. Yet Augustine took seriously the question of whether or not monstrous races races shared a common ancestry with humans. Were they descended from Adam and Eve? He argued that, that they were descendants of Adam, they had souls, and therefore capa were capable of achieving salvation. God, he reasons, being all-knowing and all-powerful, must have created these monsters for some divine purpose. Go, Tim. Tim. Walking out of... Oh, I always have to check and see if I'm muted. Uh, walking out a baggage claim, pushing an overstuffed 
luggage cart, groggy and disoriented after an 11-hour flight from Seattle, Bob Weiss was looking for someone named Joe. He had been anxious before taking off, having never heard of his Chinese carrier, Hainan Airlines, but the flight had been pleasant. The business class service attentive. He read a novel and dozed as the flight traced in reverse the migratory path of civilization along the Alaskan coastline before turning left near the Bering Strait. Flying over the chain of islands, anthropologists believe once formed a land bridge on which the first humans to reach North America walked over from Asia. Time itself spun forward at the international date line, and the airliner soon raced over Siberia, Mongolia, and Manchurian China before descending into the afternoon haze, shrouding the ancient city of Beijing. Ooh. Bob? This is the story of patent number 91304, a strange invention which has gone around the whole world, an invention which more or less indicates that the cavity of a little cardboard model of the Great Pyramid of Cheops can affect the steel edge of a razor blade. <laughs> I have actually heard that before. Is it my turn? I guess it's my turn. Amethyst was worn by the first Christians and later bishops. It is the stone of St. Valentine and of, of faithful lovers. Because St. Valentine is believed to have worn an amethyst ring engraved with an image of Cupid. Where as an engagement or eternity ring for fidelity or as a locket to call back lost love. However, it was once believed that a person could call any love by speaking his or her name in an amethyst, even if that person was committed to another. An unpolished amethyst in the bedroom guards against nightmares and insomnia. Not where I thought it was going, did you? No. Um, <laughs> rub anti-clockwise in the center of the forehead. Just yeah, above, you had me at rub, between, too. Yeah, <laughs> rub between the eyes, the seat of the third eye, especially effective for children's night tremors or fears of the dark. It helps to protect against homesickness and enhances Reiki treatments. Placed in the center of the brow, it aids meditation and visualization. Keep unpolished amethyst near other crystals to recharge them. Must you read straight from a chemistry textbook? <laughs> I mean, really. <laughs> amethyst is my birthstone. It's also, also supposed to ward off drunkenness, I believe. That's, that's yeah. the uh, uh, Klein and Hurlbut's uh, Manual of Mineralogy. I know it well. <laughs> well according, according to the index, it's also supposed she to protect against... She is a rock expert. Yeah, according to the index, is also supposed to protect against ghosts and negative earth energies. What does well? It again, do? it's true. I have a, a. It's my birthstone, and I hardly ever see ghosts. Granted, I hardly ever wear amethyst. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So it do repels you know. yetis too. Mm -hmm. Oh, how much? How much? Oh. Okay, uh, I have landed the end of the beginning in Natural History. Steve J. Gold, which I haven't read yet. It's on my list. Eve. Monsters and Grotesques in Medieval Manuscripts by Alex Bovey. Oh, cool. Pretty Grotesque. pictures. Man oh. with a head beneath his shoulders. Yeah. Wow. Tim? I don't know if you can see this, but it's called Brave Dragons. A Chinese basketball team, an American coach, and two cultures clashing by Jim Yardley. It's got no skeptic connection at all, but I happen to know some of the people who figure in this story. Uh, it's about the first NBA coach who ever uh, uh, coached a team in China, Bob Weiss. And again, someone's trying to trick me into thinking there were dragons. No. <laughs> There's a team called the Dragons. Yeah. Yep. yeah. See? It was a dragonfly, not a dragon. So no actual dragons were harmed in the making of this episode. No, <laughs> go ahead, Bob. This, uh, I, you, you'll never guess. Max Toth and Greg Nielsen's number one bestseller, Pyramid Power. Ooh. <laughs> Pyramid Power. I remember Classic. that stuff. Yeah. Yep. Well, mine is the Complete Crystal Handbook, handbook uh, by Cassandra Easton. Eason? Eason. Uh, someone I'd never heard of, but I found it in a store locally here and just had to have it. <laughs> really? It's um, just too much. That, re that reminds me of a Scooby-Doo episode when when Velma finds the Crystal Amacy book and Shaggy goes, Crystal Amacy? I went to school with <laughs> the Crystal Amacy. <laughs> <laughs> 
was looking to see when the copyright is. It's, it's actually it's 2010, so it's recent. Oh, like so this is like cutting edge stuff. stuff. Yeah, that's cutting great. Edge. It's the the, same the, that 21st century power. crystals. Yeah. Uh, awesome. We got one more minute. We got any questions? Any snarky comments worth mentioning? Uh, no, an old friend is in the comments, and that's nice. all I'm going to say. Yeah. Oh, yeah. boy. He's uh, doing court tomorrow, so he's oh, probably yeah. in a bad mood. Mm. Good luck well, with that. Well, on, on, on that note, it's time to dance. <sighs> Let me get my notes. I'll start this. Dun, dun, dun. The Virtual Skeptics is an independent production of Doubtful News. What's the harm.net, Skeptic Humanities, and me. <laughs> cool poster. Our logo is designed by Sarah Mayo at SarahMayo.com. Our theme song is by Tremor and used with... I don't, I don't have a spinny chair. <laughs> I do, but I don't...